here, Skip. Thanks, Clay. <laughs> it is absolutely boring. <laughs> so uh, he, Dr. Javernick was giving me help because I had jeans on. You know, I told him the reason is Rocky, a year ago, did both my knees, replaced both, and I've dropped about 25 pounds on my thighs, and so my suit pants don't fit. <laughs> so I looked at my wife. She goes, those are a little big. I'm like, yeah, so um, I wore jeans <laughs> from Wyoming. Yeah. <laughs> so my, my talk is musculoskeletal effects of thyroid and the hormonal abnormalities. I've wanted to do this talk for years, but not sure how this will come off because I do a lot of alternative stuff, so I don't know if anyone does bioidentical hormone in the crowd or uh, any of this, but it's a little alternative, but I've been doing this now for almost 30 years. Um, my clinic, mostly in Cheyenne, I do, uh, half of my clinic now has become hormones and thyroid just by uh, the way it has come together. Um, I don't have any disclosures, I guess. And then, uh, do I click this? Is that how this goes on? I don't know. Okay, so I don't have any, um, anybody paying me uh, to do this. <laughs> So basically, I graduated my residency, family practice residency in 1988. And when I left residency, I really, I swore off women's hormones and, and thyroid forever because it made no sense what we were doing. I just, I'm, I, I just, I've studied hormones for so long. I've studied testosterone for men since high school. And um, it just, it's like there was no balance. I'm like, where's the other hormones? Everyone just got estrogen. And I, so I just thought, I just don't understand it, so I won't do it. So um, I graduated in 1988, and um, since then, I, I went into the emergency room initially and did advanced study in sports medicine because the, the fellowships at the time I came out, there was like two of them, and they were basically just doing history and physicals for surgeons, and it wasn't good. Dr. Jack Harvey, who was one of our uh, founders of OCR, was my mentor, and he was like, take all the, take all the courses, and um, he helped kind of get me grandfathered in to take the sports medicine boards. And he was like, you have a niche in Cheyenne. You could go off and do a fellowship and lose a niche. So I stayed, and he was uh, very helpful for me. So in 1992, I started my clinic and um, started my practice at, there in Cheyenne. And we had a gym. We, we have the gym. And so what was, what was happening is I was getting all the women coming to me for weight loss since we had the, the gym. So we are torturing these women, exercising, dieting, doing everything right, and losing nothing. And I kept telling them, I don't know what it is. It's hormones. You know, in residency, they always told us, oh, they're closet eaters. I don't think so. I think not all of them. And so we weren't getting anywhere. And I kept telling them, it's hormones, it's thyroid. I don't know what it is, but it's coming. So. Um, in 1997, I was speaking at a convention in San Diego, California, and on a nutritional product that, that really didn't do anything. Um, <laughs> but, for, but I would say I'm a product of great mentors. And so I was speaking there, and at the same time, Dr. John R. Lee was the original hormone guru out of Sebastopol, California. He was speaking on hormone replacement and bioidentical hormones. And so um, he and I had dinner together afterwards, and I picked his brain till three in the morning. Finally, someone made it logical and balancing the hormones. And uh, so I was really fortunate. So then he kind of got me started. And then he, um, let me go on. Um, so, so that was when I started the clinic. And then um, I was in San Diego. And then, so Dr. John R. Lee, was the original hormone guru and uh, pioneers in the bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. He turned me over to Dr. David Zava. Zava was the one that discovered saliva testing for uh, hormones and cortisol. And the guy's brilliant. Um, he's out of Beaverton, Oregon. And, and so he pretty much hand trained me. And so basically when they talk about bioidentical hormone replacement, I don't know if anyone here does any of that. Does anybody dabble in that? Well, hope, hopefully you can You'll, you'll learn something from this, <laughs> or 
I learned something from you. But um, basically, it's the molecule your body makes that's the identical hormone. So when you change the hormones, any at all, it changes the function. Because especially when you look at testosterone and estradiol only vary by one hydrogen atom, you can't mess with that molecule without getting side effects. So um, Dr. Zava developed uh, and runs the ZRT lab in Beaverton, Oregon. And, and you can still look up his information. The guy's brilliant. But I've been to his lab. Um, he's got five, $10 million worth of robotics. And it's, it's quite impressive. So I was just fortunate enough to be um, able to be trained by the right guys. So then in 2003 was the first real conference they put on for this, and it was in uh, uh, Jackson Hole, Wyoming. There's only about two, 300 of us at the time really doing this. And um, at the time, I was really just doing hormones and just trying to figure out the hormones. And Dr. Brownstein, who you might have heard of David Brownstein, who's out of the Northwest, he's up there and he says, those of you out there doing hormones and you're not doing thyroid, you're missing half of them. So I thought, no wonder half of them aren't doing very well. So it's all about symphony, and, and hormones, honestly, it's the epitome of the more you learn, the less you know. Now, I, I know why people don't go into endocrinology, because it's hard. And so um, it gets more and more confusing. And so I've been wanting to do this talk for a long time, but I don't know if I can take 30 years of this work and put it into 30 minutes. So this has been the hardest one I've ever put together. Um, I want to go with, uh, I can't even turn this. Um, so first I'm going to go with more with the hormones and the musculoskeletal issues. I'll talk testosterone first with women. So when we talk testosterone, low testosterone, we will see inability to maintain muscle and muscle wasting, weight gain, abdominal fat, osteoporosis. I, think, I still think osteoporosis is more of a hormonal issue um, and so we see the bone loss and osteopenia, backache, joint pain, and stiffness. These are things you need to look at and, and, and keep this in the back of your mind. Could it be a hormone-related issue? Um, decreased physical ability and fatigue. Now, with women, if I get, the, I do a lot of testosterone in women. I use topicals. There's a bunch of different uh, methods of delivery, and I'll go over some of that. But I like the topicals. And if I get them too high, the main, the main symptom I see, because women are like, am I going to grow hair and deep voice and all this? Not generally unless you get them real high. What I tend to see if I get them a little too high is they'll get edgy. I've had two women lose jobs. And so you, you gotta, if they start getting snappy, you back down. So I make sure their husbands are aware. <laughs> this. Now, men, when they're low, get grumpy. So men are edgy when they're low, and men tend to mellow out when you get their levels up. It's testosterone, I've studied testosterone since high school. It's, I, f I love testosterone. It's so safe. And I've watched the, like the bodybuilders and the, and the powerlifters. I don't treat those guys. Um, back when I was in residency, I used to call Dr. Robert Kerr, who was the original hormone guru out of Los Angeles and took care of all the knuckleheads. Um, and I used to call him... He took my calls, he sent me his books. The guy was terrific, so I've just been really lucky, but he was the one who said, stay away from bodybuilders and powerlifters, because they'll take what you give them and whatever they can get in the gym and then sue you when they get in trouble. So I don't treat those guys. But I have, through the years, followed them in my gym, because we have a lot, we used to have a lot of the knuckleheads. And, um, and they, I had guys doing 1,000 milligrams injectable a day for years. If you dose Tylenol like that, everyone would die. We know it's safe. It's just gotten a bad rap because of the athletes. I always say the athletes ruined it because if one's good, ten's better. And what they did is they chased the docs off. So the doctors really have stayed, have avoided it for so many years, but now you're seeing it come back around. You're seeing these boutique uh, deals coming up. I don't like some of it because it's turning into a, a money grab. Um, next, I'll go, I'm going to look at, oh, come on. Progesterone. So this was really the first hormone that I thought was the panacea, the, the key to life, and everybody got pro progesterone. But again, it's all about balance. So low progesterone in women, you can get increased inflammation, 
more pain, increase in fertile infertility, and then what Dr. Lee coined the term estrogen dominance, where estrogen becomes your dominant hormone. The progesterone is your buffer. So I use progesterone even in my men's testosterone because it, it buffers. It, it, it's a natural 5-alpha reductase inhibitor and blocks that conversion to estrogen. So um, they'll get the estrogen dominance effects, which you get weight gain, mood swings, hot flashes, and night sweats. The night sweat, the, and hot flashes and night sweats are not from a lack of estrogen, because if it was, you'd be your 80-year-olds that get it, and they don't get it. It's from an estrogen that fluctuates. It's, the brain doesn't like a change in level. So what we're trying to do really is just level it. And so when you give them enough estrogen, it'll stop it, but then they get the cancers and whatnot. So the progesterone has a stabilizing effect on the receptors. So a lot of those, uh, the vasomotor symptoms, you can get rid of 86% of them just with the progesterone. Um, so prolonged use, you can get some other things, and you can read that. Um, the mainstream, they don't think you need progesterone if you're not having babies anymore. We know it's progestational hormone supports pregnancy. And when a normal woman makes about 20 milligrams of progesterone a day, when they're pregnant, they'll go up to 500 or better. So we know it's safe because you wouldn't expose a baby to that. But it's also what I think makes women a little tired, put, lets them sleep. I say it's God's way of putting them to sleep. Um, but also some, some women are euphoric. Some women have terrible uh, pregnancies, so I can't always go by that. But um, it's... It does so many more things. They found 22 other receptor sites for it in the brain. Um, estrogen itself, estrogen has about 400 functions in women. For the musculoskeletal issues, my big thing is I think it helps with the, to, to prevent the osteoporosis. What's interesting, even just this month in the family practice news, they came out with another postulate, you know, does estrogen, hormone replacement therapy, does it help with osteoporosis, osteopenia? But they're still going back to the Women's Health Initiative test years ago, which was a terrible study and mainly, was, mainly dealt with Premarin and Provera. And we know Provera has so many bad effects, increases breast cancer percent, 8% per year additively. So they're still going, jumping on this Women's Health Initiative when it's really, when you balance the hormones, we know that it, um, it helps with bone mineralization and protecting the bones. Um, so first I want to uh, say um, on the estrogen, I mainly add it with hot flashes, night sweats, or vaginal dryness. Um, but the hot flashes, night sweats, most of those I can do a lot with just the progesterone. But so I don't, I don't see a lot of deficit in estrogen in our country. We get, we get inundated with what we call xenoestrogens, chemicals, pesticides, preservatives, act like estrogen in our body. And then even my men, so many of the men that I test will have their estrogen levels even higher than their testosterone levels. And so um, it's, that's, that's an issue. I want to go over, there's the three estrogens. Estrone is the bad one, which cause, really kicks off the cancers. Um, it's 10% it's in women premenopausally, but increases to 80% with menopause. Estradiol is your most potent estrogen. It's 10% in women prior to menopause. It decreases to zero with menopause. Estriol is the protective. It's a good estrogen, and it's normally 80% premenopausally, and it drops to 0% afterwards. When, when estrogen gets too high, again, we see the weight gain, headache, water retention, achy joints, poor sleep as well, and I see the breast tenderness and swelling. And the same reason, Dr. Lee taught me, the same reason estrogen makes your breast swell, makes your brain swell. So that's why a lot of women get the, what we consider estrogen-related headaches. Um, but it does help maintain muscle and bone mineralization. So I wanted to look uh, briefly at bone histology. <clears throat> if you look at the bone, there's a natural process called apoptosis where you have cell death, cell regeneration, just like your skin cells slough off and regenerate. So the osteoclasts are little Pac-Man cells that go in and they'll eat out an area of bone. Oh, thank you. That's my daughter. Thank you. <laughs> um, and so um, it'll, the osteoclasts go in and eat out an area of old bone and then the osteoblasts come in and lay down new bone. It's a natural process, and they think maybe you regenerate your bones every seven to nine years. What we see, the estrogen can have a slowing effect 
on the osteoclast, which is good. So they always thought, well, let's treat estrogen, let's treat it with estrogen, but it really only improves the bone density about 1%. That's why the bisphosphonates came out and said, well, we're twice as good as estrogen because it went to 2%. But um, so the bisphosphonates just basically shut off the osteoclast. So now you no, you no longer reabsorb old bone. And after years, you end up with a lot of old bone and brittle bone. The, the progesterone and the testosterone actually uh, potentiates or um, helps the osteoblasts, which go in and lay down new bone. So I'd rather work on that end of it then just shut off the osteoclast. So I think the bisphosphonates, your adendrolate, Fosamax, all of those. They're, they're. The original bisphosphonates they used to clean the bathtub ring in your, t in your tub because it eats cells. It's real caustic and I think it's, I, so we should give it to the women. Um, <laughs> um, sorry. Um, low testosterone in men. Um, I think that testosterone is the most underutilized medicine we have. I think it's so safe and, and done right, it's very safe. Um, so basically you'll see with low testosterone men, you'll see decreased muscle and bone. Backache, I think is really a big one, joint pain and stiffness. And they, they, they've shown an increased risk of all-cause mortality independent of other risk factors. With age, testosterone decreases and sex hormone binding increases. Estrogen, if estrogen increases, also increases sex hormone binding globulin. Sex hormone binding globulin binds preferentially to testosterone, and if it's bound, then it has no, has no activity. It's the free form of the estrogen, which is your active form. Um, and so then an increased sex hormone binding globulin, also they've shown, increases the osteoporosis. <clears throat> and the hypothyroidism, can also contribute to low testosterone. So again, they, they, these hormones work in symphony together. Um, so men, I've seen the, the biggest drop, when I met Dr. Lee, he was saying our biggest drop in testosterone levels in our men was in the 40s. And that's what I was seeing, but I, they were seeing each generation seems to be getting worse. I have them in their 20s now on it. It's like, it's kind of spooky. But what, what he said, at the time when I met with him, they were studying, he was doing a study, study, studying the alligators in the swamps in Florida, and the babies are coming out sterile, and they think it's mom's exposure to all these chemicals, pesticides, affecting the ovaries and testicles of the offspring. And so that's, I think, why we're seeing each generation get a little worse. Um, let's see, go here. Um, so again, once again, estrogens and the androgens seem to shorten the lifespan of the osteoclast and extend the life of the osteoblast and osteocytes, both of which are indispensable for bone formation. Um, this is another little side deal of mine. Every guy that I've tested, treated through the years with low back issues from age you know, 25 to 65 with herniated discs, bad low back stuff with no real insult or injury, just wear and tear, every one of those guys that I've tested has been low testosterone. It's a study I've always thought would be fun to do, but I don't do research. So I throw that, so I throw that out to someone that may be interested because I know Dr. Zabad would help us. Um, so how to increase levels of testosterone. So that's kind of where you're seeing a lot of these places pop up. There's, I use, um, you can use injections. I'm not a huge injection fan, but you can. It just sometimes creates a bit of a roller coaster. Um, pellets have become big. I'm not a fan of pellets. I, uh, in fact, I met with the head gal, Pamela Smith, who's the head gal of the A4M. She's like, stay away from pellets. You can't get them out. You can't change it. They're expensive. And I had a lady I saw yesterday, and she had an abscess from her. So it's like, I just think, I think there's, it's easier and cheap, cheaper ways of doing it. The pellets, I think, is a money grab. I know a gal that works at a spa in uh, Casper, Wyoming. She said, yesterday in pellets, we made 11,500. So it, they sell it to us based on how much we can make, but I, I personally don't think it's right. Um, there's also trochies. I stay away from the trochies. Dr. Zava and I were having dinner one night at one of the conferences. He says, uh, stay away from the trochies. He said, I got sleep apnea from it because I hypertrophied everything in his throat. So I personally use creams. Uh, topicals, and I've done this now about 27 years, 25 years. Um, remember when Barry Bonds got busted? He said, I just use this cream. I'm like, 
cream works, all right? Um, so then there's also, if, if you become someone younger with lower testosterone levels, you can try the HCG, the human chorionic gonadotropin injections, if their LH and FSH, if the luteinizing hormone and FSH are low, below three, it may help. If they're above three, it doesn't help. So that's just a kind of little side tidbit. Um, <clears throat> estrogen in men. So we'll see elevated estrogen, especially if they're on testosterone, without the right uh, mix to keep the estrogen down, you'll see gynecomastia. I had a gentleman uh, a couple months ago who's like an all-star wrestler guy, I guess. Um, and he was doing really high doses of injectable testosterone. And he had gyno, but he was lactating. I'm like, I think you're way too high. So <laughs> I was like, I have never quite seen that. But um, so the gyno and decreased sex drive, uh, increased risk of stroke, increased heart attacks, um, increased rheumatoid arthritis, um, prosthetic hypertrophy and prostate cancer. Now that's the other thing is they always wanted to blame testosterone for prostate cancer. And my first question to Dr. Lee when I met with him was, do you think testosterone caused prostate cancer? He said, absolutely not, we know it doesn't. I said, then why are we still castrating these guys? He said, well, it's also where they make estrogen, it's the estrogen doing it. So every guy I've tested with prostate cancer, and I've had a bunch of them come to me, has been high estrogen, low testosterone. So I really do believe it's the estrogen doing it how to decrease the estrogen in men. Well, if they're on testosterone and it's high, I don't even follow testosterone levels, I follow estrogen. If the estrogen starts to climb, we back off. But you can decrease the testosterone. On the people doing injectables in that, um, you can use, there's some different things. I'm not a fan, I don't think you should use like the dutasteride, finasteride, you can go with the anastrozole. But in my cream, I always add the progesterone because it's a natural 5-alpha reductase inhibitor and blocks that conversion. And you can add chrysin. I haven't done a lot of the chrysin yet, but that'll work as well. You also have them lose weight, which because the more, that, more fat they carry, the more they'll uh, aromatize to estrogen. So um, decrease alcohol intake, and then there's some supplements they can, they can use. A few other hormones just to... to for the topic of musculoskeletal, found that five milligrams of melatonin a, day, melatonin a day may show some pain levels decreasing. Oxytocin, low oxytocin seems to be connected with fibromyalgia and low back pain. And apparently low pregnenolone can contribute to the arthritis. I don't do a lot of pregnenolone, but um, some of you may do better with that. I've not really been great at that. I don't readily understand it. Thyroid, this is really where I think you're gonna see the most musculoskeletal issues in your practice. So some of the, I'll just quickly go through some of the symptoms. Arthralgias, muscle aches, and the achy, crampy legs. The achy, crampy legs are really big. If, I, if I'm seeing someone with back pain or someone with knee pain or whatever, and you can just look at them, They're, they look miserable, they feel miserable, they're tired, you just kind of start. If you really look at and talk to your patients, look at them and kind of, pay attention. I'll say, hey, do, do your feet cramp or your legs cramp at night? Oh, yeah, all the time. That's thyroid. Um, cold hands and feet, not everyone, not everyone gets every symptom. You only have two of these. Cold intolerance, fatigue, dry skin, cracking nails, constipation, hoarseness, weight gain, decreased energy, all of this, you can read that. Hair loss is my favorite symptom in women because um, you can titrate the dose right till it stops. Hair loss in men, there's a lot of reasons. But hair loss in women, if they're, dump, if they're dumping hair, I think, I think thyroid, okay? Um, why do we see so much thyroid? Especially in this part of the country, the mountain states and the Great Lakes states are the worst for iodine deficiency, and you gotta have iodine to make thyroid hormone. The T3 and the T4 is iodine molecules, the three and the four. Um, we, uh, the Great Lakes states and mountain states. I was uh, fortunate enough also to meet and go to a conference by Dr. Guy Abraham. Dr. Guy Abraham was out of uh, Germany, and he this was 27 years ago. And he was he studied the Japanese people, and because they eat so much seaweed, they get on average 35 to 50 milligrams of iodine a day. And and our recommended daily allowance in our country is a tenth of a milligram, 0.15 milligrams. And that's really just enough to sustain life. 
So in the, like the late 20s is when they iodized the salt, but they've really done nothing with it since. And then everyone gone to sea salt, which is really better for you, doesn't have the iodine. So the iodine is really big. Even in my young athletes that cramp, um, put them on the iodine and it'll stop it. It's in about by four or five days, they'll stop cramping. It's crazy. Um, so the, originally there was a Lugol solution, but, you can get, but it tastes terrible. So I use these iodorol tablets. You can get it on Amazon. It's a 12 and a half milligram tablet, five milligrams of iodine, seven and a half milligrams of a potassium iodide form. Um, where else am I here? Um, okay. So I want to quick, if I can do it quick, <laughs> go through the, the thyroid cascade. Because I think it's important to, to see this. And it can be kind of busy. Where's my pointer? Is this? All right. So basically, hop, hypothalamus tells the pituitary gland to make TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. Mainstream medicine just follows TSH. So the TSH tells the thyroid gland to make T4 thyroxine. T4 is not your main active hormone. It converts in the liver and kidneys to T3, drops in iodine. That's your main main uh, functioning hormones five times stronger or, or more functional than T4. When T4 drops, it sends a feedback to raise TSH. So, and when it goes up, it sends a feedback to drop TSH. Mainstream medicine lives and dies by TSH. So when I came out of residency, we accepted a TSH up to 10, was, was nuts. Then it went to six, a lot of them are at 4.5 now, a lot of them are at three. We really think anything over two is too high. But more than anything, I go by the T3. The only time I see symptoms of too much thyroid is when that T3 gets over five. And the last conference I went to in LA, one of the main presenters I was talking to, he just looks at me and goes, stop testing the TSH. I still do it because I'm old school, but I don't live by it. Now, under stress, and this is the weird thing, is, is under stress, it'll go to a reverse T3, which is a reverse polymer of this molecule and has no activity. It also happens with amiodarone, beta blockers, um, and uh, diet, uh, diet, dieting, or no, wait, was that? Um, Dilan and others. Um, and to help, help get it to go to T3, we use the zinc, selenium, and iodine. Um, I also test the thyroid peroxidase and the thyroglobin antibodies. If the antibodies are high and everything else is normal, those people are going to end up on thyroid. If they have symptoms, I'll treat them, okay? Um, what else on that? Okay, let's go to the next one. So here's kind of a busy slide, and you can read most of this. Um, but thyroid is interesting. is the biggest division or controversy I've seen in medicine between the alternative medicine and the mainstream. I don't know if the others have noticed this. But the endocrinologist will scream at my patients. He's going to kill you and all this stuff. I'm not killing anybody. Um, but it's just, it's the biggest division we've ever seen. And they will not look at T3. They don't test reverse T3. And, um, and under stress, you don't convert well. So who's not under stress in this country? Um, so thyroxine, triodothyroid. You, you guys can read this. I don't want to waste your time on that. Um, I use a lot, I still use a lot of uh, levothyroxine, Synthroid. I like Synthroid better than Levo because it's brand name. I learned this from one of my patients who's a pharmacist. She said, no, uh, generics allow 25% up or down on the dose. Thyroid's the one thing I don't know that you can do that with. If I, so if, they're, if, if they can afford it, I put them on the Synthroid um, and then the levothyroxine. But I, do, I use a lot of the desiccated thyroid. The original one was Armour Thyroid. Um, it's been out since the 40s. The original guy that really did a lot of work on that was Broda Barnes. And he, it was in Fort Collins at the Broda Barnes Institute. And he's kind of started that. But then once they found the TSH, it all, it all changed. Um, so there's a, I'm not going to get into necessarily treatment, but it, it tells you here how to make the conversion. Um, but there's correlation, again, with low T3 and death. I found T3 is less than 3.1 is a strong predictor of death in a cardiac patient. And this thirst study that they did showed the use of T3 actually for myocardial infarction. So there's a lot of um, uh, neat deals. Um, I'm going to go, it looks like they're wanting me to probably leave. Um, 
Um, again, um, high thyroid, they always say, okay, what happens if I get you too high? The, the thought is always, oh, it causes osteoporosis. I have never seen it. Um, osteoporosis is a hormonal issue, I think, and not a thyroid issue so much. But they, this Kelly TJ, they did the effect disorder. They did this study in 2014 and said it does not appear to be a risk factor for osteoporosis. Um, take home points real quick. Don't forget to ask about other symptoms on your patients. Talk to them. You know, do you lose hair? Do you, do you sleep good? Low thyroid, they'll get real irregular sleep. Even though you're tired all the time, they sleep terrible. Um, uh, think about hormones, especially the thyroid. Uh, the women seem to be more affected, or maybe they're more vocal, but still ask the men. So real quick, I want to go through the thyroid symptoms one last time. You can, well, you can read all those, but I really want to hit muscle aches and weakness, muscle cramps. The cramps is a big one. If your legs are cramping, you got to look. Um, pain, numbness and tingling in the hands and fingers. Carpal tunnel, it can, lead to, it can uh, help with the carpal tunnel. Hormone imbalances. Again, muscle weakness, decreased muscle mass, muscle aches, tenderness, stiffness or swelling in the joints, osteoporosis, and don't forget with testosterone, low back issues. I, I, I think it's worth testing those people. Let's see. Thank you. So I guess questions of maybe a couple. I'm sorry? Oh, the DHEA I've not had terrific luck with. Women get a little bit more out of DHEA. It's a precursor to dehydropyandus room, precursor to the hormones. You may see some bump, with, and the women seem to do well with it, and there's been some good work with, done with that. The men, I've not seen anything. I don't know if your experience is different. Anybody else? Yes. I'm sorry. What are we doing to expose, to, to decrease that? Oh, good point. Um, I think it's a lot of it, your, your process, but, not, but, but again, we're inundated with uh, chemicals, pesticides, preservatives, petrochemicals. When I talked to Dr. Lee about it, I said, why are we seeing estrogen climbing and testosterone, progesterone dropping? He said, we're not seeing it in third world countries. It's the industrialized countries. So I don't know if there's really a great avoidance. That's why I think working on balancing the hormones. Anyone else? Okay. Armor thyroid versus for versus thyroxin. Again, the pig gland it come, armor thyroid comes from the pig gland. The pig gland makes T3 and T4. I just like it because I know you're getting both. But I have if there's a hundred ways to skin in a cat with this, and I got people that do really well on on thyroxin so long as they convert well, and then I have those that. Um, I switch. I found, I, I will say this, my thyroidectomy patients seem to do better on the natural thyroid because there's other things in it. Um, but I had this argument with our endocrinologist years ago. And I said, what about those people that don't convert? She goes, no, they all convert. I said, no, I'm testing. No, they don't all convert. She goes, no, they all convert. I said, you're not listening. <laughs> and I hung up. All right. <laughs> Thank you.